So, as I mentioned earlier this morning, I grew up in Cherry Valley, Arkansas. Um, it sounds a lot nicer than it actually is. Um, it's not that, not that grand. Um, but I lived there my whole life, uh, from the time I was born to the time I went off to college. Um, the culture in small town Arkansas is it's very evangelical. Um, evangelicalism is kind of the culture itself, because everybody's so wrapped up in that. Um, that being said, my parents weren't very religious. We started going to church when I was five, and it was more of a, just because I think that's what we were supposed to do type deal. Um, but I was the one that really bought into it. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about that later. Um, the culture in Southern America, not Southern America, Southern U.S., um, is very wrapped up in the religion and the music. And so I grew up in an environment that was all about getting together and playing hymns, and as Carl calls them, the songs of my people. Um, and so we're going to start tonight with kind of a little fun one. Uh, this is a song, uh, I started listening to this song when I was um, a wee little lad, um, probably as soon as I learned how to talk. My grandpa used to play this song all the time. This was his favorite song to play on the guitar. And uh, so my family was really into this. And so I'm going to ask you guys to sing along with him. You've probably never heard it before. You may have. It was written by Hank Williams Sr. Um, way back in the 50s. And uh, it's called I Saw the Light. You're welcome to stand, set, whatever you want to do during music time. But you do have to participate. That's my only rule. So. You don't have to sing, but you have to, like, if you don't feel like singing, you have to at least stomp your foot or something. Because old Southern hymns, it's all about the passion, all right? It's all about the passion. And most of the time, these guys had no idea what they were singing about. Uh, most of the time, it was theology that was way over their heads. But they didn't care, because it was all about getting the family together and tapping along and dancing like a redneck, all right? Yeah. Hey. 
church called Oakview General Baptist Church, um, which is where my family always went. My grandpa was a deacon there way back in like the 40s. It um, was a little bit north of where I grew up, a town called Greenfield, Arkansas. Again, not quite as grandois as it sounds. Um, it was literally in the middle of a rice field, and it was a church of about 30 people. Uh, but it was beautiful. I loved it. I loved the people there. I still love the people there, um, even though we may not agree on a few things. Um, I still keep in touch with my Sunday school teacher. She made such a huge impact on my life. Her name was Ms. Sheila. And I used to go in there, probably seven years old, and I had so many questions. I've always been, I've always been one to ask questions. I used to drive my parents crazy. Um, they had a, I, learned, I later found out they had a system. I didn't know this was going on because I kept asking why about everything. Why do we do this? Well, why do we do that? Well, why does this work this way? Why, why, why? And so they finally worked out a system where they would work in shifts to where the other one could get a break and they would send me to the other room. Um, but whenever I went to Miss Sheila with questions, she, she always gave me an answer. She never brushed me off as just being a kid because I really... When I say I bought into this, I mean I really bought into this. The first time I heard the gospel, I was hooked. I, didn't, I can't tell you why. Um, that was very southern one, I can't tell you. Um, but, but I can't, I can't tell you why, but I was just drawn. And in that little church, even though I don't quite agree with their theology today, they still love Christ. And I, and I have to keep thinking back to that, that even though they may not agree with who I am, they're still doing the best they can. And so I get very, I get very fed up with people today, um, now that I'm a liberal Christian. Um, but I go back to that. I take myself back to when I was seven, eight, nine, ten years old in that little country church. And I remember the, the joy and the peace that they had was very real. And I know God is working on them in the same way he's working on me, just maybe a different area. But one of the worst things that we can get ourselves into is an us and them mentality. And you really have to watch that, especially, especially because we've been hurt. Um, when you've been hurt by conservative Christianity and cut deeply, it's really easy to get bitter. Uh, I, I have to fight it all the time. Um, but I always go back to that country little church. And I remember the things they did teach me that was great. They did teach me the gospel. They did teach me about community. They did teach me about love. And they did teach me about being a good neighbor and a good person. And I'm forever grateful for that. My salvation moment happened when I was about five. And I remember sitting in the pew on my little coloring book. 
that my aunt always gave me, who she was also the pianist. Um, and uh, is, that, is that how you guys say it, pianist? We call it pianist. So <laughs> I figured that definitely wasn't what you guys called it. Um, I, remember the, I remember the sermon um, was just talking about this eternal hell that you didn't want to go to. And I didn't quite understand all of it, but I knew I didn't want to go there because I heard the preacher talking about it. And he was this big, burly guy, big bellowing voice, always tapping his head like I'm doing right now because he's sweating all the time. Um, and I remember thinking, okay, I don't, I don't want to go to hell. I know that. Um, so what do I need to do? And, and the answer came in the altar call. Um, and if you grew up around the evangelical, evangelical church, you know exactly what the altar call is. comes at the end of the service. Got to walk that aisle right down the middle, come to the front. I took the preacher by the hand, and I was like, I don't want to go to hell. He was like, well, that's good. I don't want you to go to hell either. And so uh, he started questioning me. You know, do you know who Jesus is? I was like, well, that's, that's God's son. Got that one right. And it kept going down the list, and then he finally was like, okay, so let's pray this prayer. And I, and I did pray the prayer, and that's the moment that life was different. Even though I was only five, like I, I, had, I, had, a, I had a quest. I had a, I had a journey at that point. I knew what I was working toward. I was working toward making this God happy because this God would send me to eternal hellfire if I didn't make him happy. And so that became my life mission to make this God happy. So I continued growing up in that, um, that church for until I was about 10 or 11. And this next song is one that I, 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 I've loved this song since I first listened to hymns. Um, that being said, I don't totally agree with the theology of this song anymore. But I still love the song. And I think that's important to note because we've all been somewhere and the places we've been has gotten us to where we are today. You can't just wipe that out of your story. It's part of who you are. It's part of your story. It's part of your journey. So even though you may not agree with that part of your story, you still have to acknowledge it. Our story is probably the most important thing we have. Um, in the Baptist church, we called it our witness. Um, but since I've left the Baptist church, I've kind of gotten a, a bigger, bigger understanding of the importance of this story. It's, it's all we have. It's all we can relate to other people to explain to them how God has affected our lives somehow. Or God, how God has brought us from point A to point B to point wherever we are today. And so you can't throw that away. I acknowledge that I don't agree with everything theologically in a lot of these songs, um, but I still love them. And I think they still have some beauty to them. And ironically, this song is about our story.
really sums up where I was at the time. It was all about the assurance. It was all about knowing that you know that you know that you know that you're saved. Because if you had any doubt that you may not have been saved, then you probably wasn't saved and you need to come back down the altar again. And so I really spent a lot of time just praying to God. I prayed to God so much that I wouldn't go to hell. <laughs> it was all the time. And then something major happened. Um, 1998, AOL. And our family got a computer. And we got the internet. And uh, I, I knew something was different about me before. Didn't quite know what it was. It wasn't like the other boys. I mean, I still did a lot of boy things. Like, I got in trouble because I would fill my pockets up with worms. My mom would go do the laundry and reach in there and get a handful of worms and, you know, chase frogs around the woods. I was a country boy. I couldn't help that. But I still knew there was something that, I don't know, I couldn't put a finger on it. But then um, my cousin told me there were um, pictures on the Internet. <laughs> and so I was like, well, I got Check this out, apparently. And uh, that, was, that was it. Uh, I knew at that moment um, I could care less about the woman. <laughs> um, 
And so over the course of a couple of years, by the time I was 13, I, I finally had a word for it. Um, I was gay. And that really, really, really got me down. <laughs> because I had spent my whole life hearing the pulpit talk about the abominable homosexuals. And I, I distinctly, I still remember the, uh, the way I, I learned what I was as a gay man was in a sermon on Sodom and Gomorrah. I remember the preacher saying the gays when he was describing uh, guys who were attracted to other guys. And I had a word now. I was like, whoa, I'm one of those. I'm one of the gays. <laughs> um, but really set me, set me off into uh, some really dark times. I'm sure a lot of you can relate. You've been there. Um, definitely left me with many nights of just weeping and praying to God to just change this. And I was mad too because it was unfair. Why did I have to deal with this? Why couldn't somebody else have to deal with being gay? Like, I just wanted to have my little Baptist life and go grow up and have my little Baptist wife didn't mean to rhyme, and be a good Republican and have two and a half kids, go to college, get a good job, be a minister, and die. Like, that's all I wanted. Like, was that really too much to ask? That was my plan from day one. And, and so it really ticked me off. I was like, why, why don't I have to deal with this? And, and so just numerous, numerous, numerous nights of, of weeping about this and praying to God, like, change this, fix this, fix this. You created the freaking universe, fix this. Like, I know you can. I know you can change it. I know you can. Why are you not listening to me? I've been a follower since I was five years old. I've given you half my life. <laughs> So why won't you fix it? Why am I having to deal with this? Now I know. I know today. Because if I wasn't gay, I know exactly where I'd be. I'd be standing behind a pulpit preaching about the gays. I knew I was headed right into the Baptist ministry. I've got a charismatic personality. I'd probably be calling for the uh, torture and jail time for gay people. So I think God knew what he was doing. But try telling 10 year old me that. I discovered a musician named Rich Mullins many years later. Wish I would have known him then. But this song, I think, really sums up where I was in that moment. Rich made a, a powerful impact on my life. But luckily, I've become friends with um, one of his old bandmates. So I get to hear a lot of cool stories. I'm, I'm friends with Mitch. Mitch was actually in the car wreck uh, in which Rich died. Um, but it, now getting to hear personal stories from Rich's best friend, um, I realized what an amazing individual he was. How much he did for the church. Um, we wouldn't be where we are today if it wasn't for him. The song is called Hold Me Jesus. If I could sit down and write how I was feeling those, those horrible nights, I think this would be the song. But since it's already done, I don't have to do any work. I just have to sing it.
That was the beginning of pretty dark years. Um, so from when I hit about 10 or 11, my family kind of dropped out of church. Um, started going deer hunting every weekend. So, you know, as a good southerner, we went hunting over Jesus. Um, not hunting over Jesus, that's weird, hunting over rather than Jesus. There we go. Um, but I was still, I, I had already bought into the theology hook, line, and seeker by this point, so there was no going back. And so even though I wasn't in church, I was still dealing with the same thing. And I think it almost made it worse because um, at least I didn't get those little pick-me-up moments that church provided, you know, of a little comfort of feeling like you're forgiven. When I hit 15, there was no, like, maybe this is a phase anymore. You know, that was out the window. I went through a couple of years, I'm like, it's just a phase, it's going to go away. Like, hey, everybody deals with this at 13, that's what the internet says anyway. Like, so it's going to be okay, like, it's going to go away. But it didn't. And, and no matter how many times I prayed and fasted and begged and pleaded, it didn't go away. And so by the time I was 15, I, I knew that this, I'm just going to have to deal with this. Something has to be done. Um, also, when I was 15, that's, well, I started driving when I was 14. We can do that in the States. I don't know if you can do that here. Um, it's a scary thought, isn't it? 14-year-olds out on the road. Um, so I, I got a truck when I was 15, and so my parents gave me the option. I could stay home on the weekend or go to the deer woods with them. And so I'm 15. Of course, I'm going to stay home by myself for a weekend. Duh. And so um, since I was staying home, I started visiting a church because they had a cool youth group. And... Uh, so I started going there, and it ended up being an every weekend thing. And I just kept sinking lower and lower and lower because the older I got, the more I dealt with it, the more I realized this isn't going away. i got to do something about this. And unfortunately, as most, not most, as a lot of kids in the same predicament, I felt that the, uh, the only option was death. Uh, and, I, and I hit that point, that I'm not going to live a life like this. I'm not going to live a life dealing with this every day. Like, I would rather just be dead than to have to live until I'm 80 fighting the same battle every stinking day. 
And coming out was not even an option. Like, it didn't even enter my mind. Um, living a gay life, as, or as an openly gay person, not even, wasn't even in the spectrum. I felt like my only option was live a life in torment, nobody ever knowing this, and just be celibate until I die, or just die now. And so, one Saturday night, um, parents were gone, and uh, I was really down. So I walk into the uh, parents' bedroom, and I grab the 20-gauge, um, and I load the chamber, and I took it back to my bedroom. I was like, this is it. I'm, like, I'm, I'm just, I just can't deal with it. can't handle this anymore. Started weeping. Having it out with God. God, I let him have it. It's like I'm going to hell anyway. <laughs> Might as well let him know how I really feel right now. <laughs> and I did. And it, but it, but the prayer just turned into just an uncontrollable sob. And I lie down on the bed. And thank God I fell asleep. And I woke up the next morning. Uh, the alarm clock went off. Scared the hell out of me because, you know, I didn't, I didn't know I fell asleep. Um, well, I, I woke up in a tremble just realizing what just happened. Like, I was that close to just being done. And uh, so I put the gun back. I went to church. That's what you did. But I also knew that if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to live this life, I need a plan. Um, that's where straight face came in. So I made a plan. I'm going to create this alter ego. The world's going to know this guy. The world's going to love this guy. He's going to be everything that you want to be. Nobody has to know who's hiding behind you. Whatever you want the world to see, you put it up. Put it out there. You put on a smile. You go around. You talk about Jesus a whole lot. And when you're not talking about Jesus, you talk about Republicans. I had this system down. I could walk into a church and own it. And I did. Straight face was born. Now, that's not to say that during the whole time, like, I, I, I didn't really believe what was going on. I, I really believed it. You know, it's not to say that I didn't pray or I didn't believe the words I was saying. No, I was doing exactly what I thought I needed to do to be a follower of Christ. Unfortunately, that type of religion, the, the religion that, that doesn't lead to life, the religion that leads to bondage, um, it forces you to create a mask. Like, you have no other choice. Even if you're not gay, you're wearing a mask because that's what you do. You put on this show because if you can convince everyone out here that you're a spiritual being, then maybe God will believe it. And that's, that's exactly the same thing I did with straight face. It was, if I can convince everybody out here that I'm a straight Christian that loves Jesus and loves the ladies, well, then God might believe that too. This next song, I'm going to actually ask you guys to join me in worship on this next song. Um, this song was a mantra for me during this period. Um, today, it has a whole different meaning than it did back then. Um, this song was my mantra of surrender to God. This was my way of saying, you know what, God? I'm putting my sexuality behind me, out of sight, out of mind, because that's what you want me to do. I'm going to be miserable, because that's what you want me to do. I'm going to hate myself, because that's what you want me to do. But I'm doing it because I don't want to go to hell. Now, like I said, today this song has a whole different meaning, and I love it just as much today, or probably more today than I did back then. Uh, but here we go.
Create a straight face, and I'm, I'm really, I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm Wednesday, Sunday, Tuesday if they have it. I'm there every time. And, I'm, and I'm, by the time I graduated high school, I publicly answered the call to ministry. I, mean, I knew that since I was a little kid, but now, I'm, now I've got a plan, right? And so, publicly answered the call to ministry, and um, I go off to college to uh, to do college things, and. Almost immediately, I won't say that, it, it was a couple of months, but it all just <laughs> fell apart. <laughs> um, I lost a really good mentor of mine. She lived across the road from me. Her name was Miss Lopez. She was my Spanish teacher. I don't think Miss Lopez ever had any idea what kind of impact she had on me, but she was this crazy hippie lady. <laughs> she was awesome. She like moved into this abandoned house across the road. I don't think they had electricity for months. Um, she put a bathtub on our front porch, if that tells you anything. Um, like, she was just the epitome hippie lady. Um, but Miss Lopez taught me unconditional love. Because I saw it in the classroom, I saw it when I was around her. She didn't care where you came from, what you've done. She's probably done it, that's why she didn't care. Um, but she just loved people. I mean, this is a lady who, she lived on maybe 20000 a year, lived in an abandoned house. Literally every Christmas, she bought a Christmas present for every single student in grades 7 through 12 because she didn't want one kid to go to Christmas without having a present. Uh, just an amazing lady. Um, but a couple months into university, um, she had a seizure while she was driving and got hit by a train. Um, and I think it made me face the brevity of life. I don't know. I, I can't tell you. In the moment, I didn't know what was going on, but I think it really made me think about that. And, uh, but also, it gave me an excuse. This sounds horrible, and I don't mean this. It's going to come out worse than I mean it. Um, I think I say that in the book, too. It comes out way worse than I mean it. Um, it gave me an excuse to be depressed. I was already depressed, but I had to hide it because I couldn't explain to people why I was depressed. So now I had a reason to be depressed, and so I ate that crap up. <laughs> like, I was like, okay, they're going to freaking know I'm sad now. Like, I couldn't tell you before, but I'm telling you now. So, like, I did the whole rebellious thing, and I started smoking, and, like, wore bandanas, because apparently that's what you do when you're depressed. That's what I thought anyway. <laughs> started wearing bandanas and tie-dye and all this stuff. And um, the BCM, Baptist Collegiate Ministry, I was very involved there. The associate came up, and he was like, dude, what's going on? I, you know, I gave him the whole spill with this low pass and all this stuff. Even though that it wasn't the reason for all of it. And um, but I really started just unraveling. And um, by this point, Straight Face was very successful. I was very angry. That's about the best way to put it. By the time I hit university, Straight Face was very, he was doing his thing. He was rocking it. Next Billy Graham. Me? Miserable angry, so mad that I had to deal with this. But I chalked it up to, to the fact that I didn't have enough faith. You do that a lot. And it's a lie. So many times we feel like our problems in life are because we, we're not good enough believers. We're not good enough followers. And that's a lie we buy into a lot. I know I do anyway. So New Year's Eve, kind of had my semester of rebellion. Um, I was on my way to my first frat party. And I had already decided, straight face is gone. Done. Done. Um, angry me was getting louder than straight face at this point. Um, I was going to go to this frat party. Well, I, okay, let me back up. When I say straight face was done, I mean, I still wasn't admitting that I was gay, okay? Like, um, I was done with that whole holier than thou thing, is what I mean by that. Because my intention was I was going to go to that party, I was going to smoke weed for the first time, I was going to get drunk for the first time, and I was going to be with a woman for the first time. That was my goal. I was like, I'm going to just give it my good college try, right? And so, 
I got in the car, I'm on my way. New Year's Eve, here I go. Um, I was back in Cherry Valley because I we, we can't stay in the dorms, uh, but the college was only an hour and a half away. On my way to the college frat party, I passed by my old church, and there's my old youth minister, and he saw me. Because he did this. I was like, Ugh! and he knew I, he, he knew I saw him because I did the whole thing. Oh, why did you make eye contact? And so I had to stop. And so I pull in, and uh, and he, I, I guess he just had that youth minister sense. He knew something was going on. So we start talking, we start chatting. I tell him most things. I still leave the gay part out of it. I um, kind of confess it to him. And uh, felt really relieved, actually. Confess some of that stuff, get it off my chest. Um, I was able to, I was at least able to talk about the anger toward God without telling him exactly why I was angry toward God. Because again, I had the excuse, Miss Lopez was dead now. So I had an excuse. I could talk about, I can tell someone else that I'm really pissed off with God. And that was very relieving to be able to do that. I didn't know how much of a relief it was going to be to be able to tell someone else how you really feel about God at that moment. I couldn't tell God. But somewhere in my brain, I thought he didn't know. It's, you know. Um, anyway, he convinces me to stay with the youth group that night for their New Year's party. So I didn't go give it the college try that night. Instead, I rededicated my life to Christ that night. And I decided that I wasn't working hard enough. If I got to this point, straight face has been doing all right. But I haven't worked hard enough. I gotta up my game. I need to get in ministry. Because that's what you do when you're totally broken, right? <laughs> How are you gonna fix it? Go into ministry. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that, but it made sense at the time. I I, I just felt like if I if I got into leadership, it was accountability. I knew I couldn't have episodes like I had right then. If I have people watching me, and I'm getting paid to do it, and it's my livelihood, I can't go spiraling off like I did the last few months. So I kind of discovered Jesus all over again. Um, but it was still the radical old, or not the radical, the, uh, the old conservative evangelical Jesus that was just there simply to keep me from burning forever. That's really what it boiled down to. Um, but I was sold out again. I was convinced that, okay, this is it. Um, this rededication was the last one. It's number 45, but it's the last one. Like, I'm all in this time, God. We got this, okay? Straight faces back on. <laughs> um, this is a song you guys will probably recognize. It's very old. It's 2,000 years old, actually, or something like that. That's a lie. It's like 1,500 years old. It's... I totally just made that one up, too. It's an old song. <laughs> it's from way back in. Um, anyway, join me with this.
So I went back to college, and um, I realized I segued, I segued into that song rather harshly. That was one of the songs that was uh, very influential when I rededicated my life for Christ. It was, I remember that song was playing. I should have mentioned that before I played it. Sorry. Um, so I went back to college that next semester, determined I'm going into the ministry. And so I get to the Baptist Collegiate Ministry and um, go to the wall. The wall was where all the announcements were searching and see an advertisement. said, uh, youth minister needed at part time. I was like, perfect, here we go. I go out to the church, or I call the pastor first, and he tells me to come out and meet him in a couple of days. So I go out there, beautiful, quaint little church, uh, probably 200 people, something like that. Uh, but they had a really nice building and this whole big garden in the back. It was really pretty. And so we're walking around the garden, and uh, straight face is on it, man. I mean, I'm like, <laughs> he's giving it his best. And before I leave, the pastor was like, well, we were planning on interviewing like another 10 people, but I think you're the, you're the guy. Like, Sweet. So um, I was in the ministry, and that's how he did it. And so I showed up the next week and got the ball rolling and kind of just built a youth group from, from nothing. They didn't have one before. And um, during that time, I'm still fighting a lot with straight face. I'm kind of over the anger part. I'm kind of past that at this point. I, really, I think just telling someone I was angry with God made me stop being so angry with God. Like, I had to just get it off my chest. Um, and so I kind of was past that. And, and by the time I got to the ministry, when I got the job, I was like, okay. I, I really, I, I literally sat down and, like, created, like, this whole personal creed for myself. Like, this is, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're not going to do, right? And so um, really just giving it as much as I can, fighting off my sexuality, like, as much as I possibly can. I'm talking, stop, I, was, I was more committed than a Muslim, okay, I'm telling you. Like, I was like, I, like, I had set times to pray every day, like I was fasting. I was doing everything I could to keep my sexuality in order. But I knew by this point there was no changing it. By this point, I was trying to forget it. And forgetting your sexuality is much harder than trying to change it. Because when you're trying to change it, it's on your mind 24-7. You have to be very aware, fighting off the looks, fighting off the feelings. When you're trying to forget your sexuality, it's reminding you all the frickin' time. It pops up when you don't want it. Like, it's just there. And so Straight Face and I are having it out a lot. Um, these little internal dialogues between he and I. And I just remember wishing for something more. I remember just going, like, is this, there's got to be more to follow in Christ than this, right? Um, I would just dream about that. Like, like what am I missing? What am I, what am I not getting right here? And that's when I went back to thinking about my grandpa. My grandpa was, I didn't really know my grandpa. He died, um, like, literally right before I was born, like a month or two. Um, but I grew up with the stories of my grandpa um, all the time. And um, hearing about how devoted he was to Christ and um, you know, just what a great person he was in general. And so at this point, I, I, I kind of I looked to that. And I wanted to get back to, quote, unquote, that good old time religion. I felt like that's what I was missing. Like I needed to get, I needed to be as sold out as the 1950s Baptists were because these 2000s Baptists have let up so much, right? Like, so I'm like, I'm turning up the game even more. So I'm going to play you a song that uh, my grandpa loved, um, even more so than I saw the light. And also, this is my obligatory Elvis song, because I'm from him. And I can't come all the way to Australia without singing an Elvis song, right? You guys have, a, have a, an Elvis day, right? I just heard about that today. This song is much more, though, than, um, than just my grandpa's one of his favorite songs. Um, coming from Cherry Valley, this song 
um, has an even deeper meaning for me. Um, and it's what I was looking for at the time. Is that Elvis enough for you? <laughs> I don't do that for a lot of people because I'm afraid they're going to try to make me dress like Elvis. <laughs> I can, but I'm not. <laughs> um, so, things are going really well at the church. Got a straight face rocking. Um, really clicking with the kids, growing. Get a phone call in my dorm room. Pastor says, hey, I need you to come up here and talk to me for a minute. Click. Crap. I have no idea what's going on. I'm just like, well, maybe one of the kids got hurt. Like, what's, what's up? Maybe they don't have enough money to support me anymore. All these things ran through my mind. I'm the type of person, don't ever do that to me. Like, tell me what we're going to talk about, because I, in my mind, it's going to be the worst thing. Like, by the time I got there, like, I was set up and I embezzlement of fraud or something. Like, somebody, I'm going to get there and there's going to be these cops. I'm going to jail for something I didn't do. Like, I had no idea what was going on. The one thing I didn't think was going to happen, though, was what happened. We're taking the same walk we did when I got hired. It's about a year into it now. Come back to the church. We sit down. It's just us. He's a sweet old man, dude. He's probably about 65, bald. And kind of, he's a really nice guy. He goes, Brandon, please don't be offended by this. Okay. He said, before I say this, I want you to know I love you. And I want you to answer truthfully. That I feel like the Spirit's been telling me that you're struggling with homosexuality. <laughs> 
Almost passed out right there. Straight face went into overdrive. What? What would ever make you think that? Are you kidding me? I love ladies. Like, what could, am I giving, I literally said this, am I giving off a gay vibe? No, 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 no. I, I, like, I just, I really feel like that's what the Spirit's telling me, and I'm, I'm here to tell you, like, I wouldn't fire you for that. Because I feel like homosexuality is a demon that's in your spirit, and we can get this out of you. When you're trying to run from your sexuality, you don't want to hear that. <laughs> so, I promised him about 15 times, there's no way I'm gay, like I'm straight, duh. And I left, and um, I knew I had to get the crap out of that church. Like, I had to get out of there. Because, remember, I'm still trying to forget my sexuality at this point. I didn't want his counseling because I spent a decade already trying to fix this demon that's been on me. There was no fixing it. I promise you, if you could pray the gay away, I would be the poster child. Because if it's possible, I would have done it. Probably a million prayers, at least. That's a conservative number. If it was possible to beg God enough to make you not gay, that would have already happened by then. And so I didn't want his counseling. I didn't want his exorcism. I didn't want any of that. Um, I want it out now. I could have told him. You know, there was that whole thought of, well, maybe... Maybe he could fix it. I don't know. Um, Steve-O, you're really making my anxiety go off because I feel like you're just going to fly out of that window. <laughs> I can't stop watching you. <laughs> um, and so I knew I had to go. And, and luckily, the next weekend was our retreat for the youth. And I had met this really cool college minister at, at, at the big church in town, the big church. Um, and he was going to come and help the scavenger hunt for my kids that weekend. And so he comes over. Kids go out. Do their thing around town. We had a couple hours to kill. So we start chatting, and by the end of the chat, it's like he's telling me that they're looking for an associate youth minister to come in. And would I be interested? It's like this is exactly what I'd be interested in. Yes. <laughs> and so he was like, uh, "Well, I'll set up a meeting with our youth pastor, and we'll we'll get there." So a week later, we meet at the little Japanese restaurant. Um, I'm straight faces on it. Except straight face really messed it up that day because um, I'd never been to a Japanese restaurant before. And so I don't think I'd ever even heard the Japanese accent before. I'm, I'm from Arkansas. And um, so I'm trying to be as proper as I can. You know, I'm like trying to put on my A game. And she comes over and she says, super salad. And I go, I don't want a salad. Super salad. No, I don't want a super salad. I, want, I don't want any salad. Like, don't give me a super salad. I don't want any salad. So they got a nice laugh out of me that day. I think it got me the job, though, because they offered me the job for a laugh. And uh, <laughs> even though I didn't get my super salad. Um, <laughs> and so I go to work for this new church. And um, the youth minister is actually who turned me on to Rich Mullins. He's a cool guy. I'm still friends with him. He's a, he's a great guy. Uh, no, the youth minister, not Rich. Um, and Rich is cool, too. Um, but he turned me on to this, this guy named Rich Mullins, and so I start listening to him. And his words are really deep, and I mean, his lyrics are amazing, and, but they're very dark. And he's preaching about, or he's singing about this, this spirituality that is filled with like doubt and mystery, and I was really drawn to it because um, he was relaying a lot of the things that I felt, you know, like with Hold Me Jesus, that song we sang earlier. Um, and he had a band called the Ragamuffin Band. I was like, where'd that come from? So I looked it up, and it came from this book called uh, The Ragamuffin Gospel by Brennan Manning. And I read that about the time I started working at the new church. And it was absolutely life-changing. Um, I, I, I pinpoint that book as the beginning of my real spiritual journey. Because this book is talking about a God that is 
so insanely in love with me that I can't even escape the love. Now, granted, I didn't think a lot of, I didn't think it really fully applied to me because I'm gay. Come on, you know, it applied to me as long as I remained celibate. That was my thoughts. God loves me as long as I don't act on this sexuality, right? Um, but that made me start start reading a lot more. Start. I'm skipping the next song, by the way. Go on to the, the next one. Um, I've gone a lot longer than I realized I had been rambling up here. Um, so, but that, that led me to um, other authors. So I, I springboarded off of Brennan Manning, started reading Steve Brown, Scandalous Freedom. Um, and Steve was talking about this immense freedom we have in Christ. And he was saying, Christ, the sacrifice of Christ is so huge, it's so major, that sin is not even an issue anymore once you're in Christ. Because there is no condemnation in Christ. And it's, it's so freeing that you can't escape God anymore. Once you're in Christ, door's locked. There's no escaping that. And knowing that you can't escape it makes you fall in love with God even more. That's what he said. Didn't buy it at first. Until I actually did believe I couldn't escape Christ. Then, I knew it to be true. It really does make you fall in love with God more. But then it happened. Then I got the courage to read the author that my pastor said I should never read. Brian McLaren. I was like, well, okay, at this point, so I'm, I'm, I've picked a major, and I, I picked philosophy, because I really fought, fought, you know, I love theology and things like that. And I think that was the best thing that ever happened to me, too, because um, philosophy gave me the permission to ask questions, because now I'm doing it in the name of academia, not in the name of questioning God. And so I started reading Brian McLaren, and then realizing that there's this whole other picture of God that I've never seen before. And uh, this was the calm before the storm. And that's why I'm going to sing this next song. It's not a church song. It's actually a very secular song. Um, but the words, I think, applied so much to where I was in that point because it was the calm before the storm. I was flying, buddy. I was in love with Christ like I'd never been in love with Christ before. I discovered grace. I discovered freedom. Didn't apply it yet, but I discovered it. By the way, this is going to be a very country song, so just prepare yourself. <laughs>
Koji is going to be country. Enter the outlaw preachers. If you were on Twitter a few years ago, there was a group of progressive Christians called themselves the outlaw preachers. I think you had one of them here a few years ago, Jay Baker. Uh, outlaw preachers got their name from Jay Baker. He did a sermon um, talking about being an outlaw follower of Christ, and it stuck, and a community was formed around that, and they blew Twitter up. For a couple of years, it was this hashtag. You, you could click on the hashtag, and it was just a stream of this progressive, inclusive theology. Um, I think it really set the wave for where we are today. Like It had a bigger impact than people realize. Um, a lot of people haven't heard of the outlaw preachers, but they, they impacted so many of the people that are in leadership today that I really think it had a much bigger, move, or a much bigger effect than we ever realized. Um, and I discovered them one day during Sunday school because uh, I would send the kids off to Sunday school and I would go to my office and wait until the sermon, you know, we'd go downstairs and join big church. Um, so I got the kids off in there one day and, and I was just thinking to myself, I was like, you know what? I wonder if there are Christians who think it's okay to be gay. Like the thought had never occurred to me before. Like I didn't even, like, oh, like, like this new idea. Christians who thought it was okay to be gay, like, I wonder if that exists. And so I type it in Google, Christians who think it's okay to be gay. And it leads me to the Outlaw Preacher's website. I go, this is kind of cool. So I, uh, I go to their, start looking at people. This one pops up, says, from Memphis, Tennessee. I was like, oh, that's close. Her name was Connie Waters, Memphis, Tennessee. So I shoot her a direct message. Hey, Miss Waters, I know you don't know me. Just wanted to chat. Um, I said something more. I don't remember what it was, but I think I told her I, was, I lived close by and I had some questions, blah, blah, blah. So I wait and I wait and I wait and I get a response. And... Um, during the same time, we're doing a play called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames, so, uh, which is this huge production, and I'm the devil, <laughs> which is awesome. I still have a picture of me like all dressed up as the devil, and the, the guy who got me the job, the, the college minister, he was Jesus, because he looked Middle Eastern, and so he fit the part. Um, but we were hanging out, and I, you know, waiting for the play to start. And uh, it's a huge production, if you've ever seen it. It's, I mean, it's horrible theology, but it's kind of fun. Um, and uh, I get the direct message back from Connie while I'm waiting to go on stage. So I said, yeah. I feel like there's a, a sermon in there somewhere. i got to find it. Um, <laughs> but I get this direct message like, hey, I wouldn't mind chatting. So I, we set it up. I, go to, I, I had been going to Memphis every Thursday anyway for seminary. Uh, we had a four-hour night course. So I was like, well, I'll slip away a little early this Thursday, and we'll meet at Chick-fil-A. Yeah, ironic. And we'll talk about this. So... I go and we meet up. I could tell she was filling me out as much as I was filling her out. Because not only was this my first straight ally I ever talked to, this is my first woman preacher I've ever talked to. So this is like a double stone right here. Like two birds with one stone. Like I'm, this is all new to me. So she comes in and she's, she pulls up in, today we call it the Fagmobile, if that tells you anything. Like she pulls up in this little beetle that's like, it changes colors from purple to baby powder blue like as the sun hits it, and it's got like all these equality stickers all over it. I'm like, what am I getting myself into? Like what just pulled up into this parking lot? And so we go and we talk, and she seems like a really cool lady, and I'm really genuinely interested. Um, and then we get there. I'm like, so, so you're telling me you think it's not a sin to be gay? Now, in the moment, I could, I could, I, I could tell... In the moment, I thought she didn't really have a good answer because of the way she reacted. But I know now, because of, you know, she's like my second mama, and we've talked about that many, many times. I know now her, re her reaction was just because she thought I was another douchebag Baptist about to come, like, ream into her theology. And so, because apparently that happened to her a lot. And uh, can I say douchebag from up here? I'm sorry. It just happened. I apologize. Um, she didn't really give me an answer. 
Basically, her answer was, you need to figure this out on your own. Um, like I said, I know now it's because she was tired of fighting. She had just lost her job, her job and her whole ministry because of where she stands on this issue. She was tired of trying to change people's mind because it was just too much at the time. Um, so that's what I did. And, we, and we, we, we formed a friendship that day. And we talked a lot, a whole lot. And I go, kept going over there and meeting her. I met her family. And I'd go over early on Thursdays. And she kind of was feeding me stuff to read. I read this. Now read this. And that's good. Now, now read this. Now listen to this sermon. Um, and eventually, I got to a point, and months and months and months and months of reading, where I realized there was a whole other way to see this issue. And it was legitimate. Like, it wasn't just wishful thinking anymore. It wasn't just me going, man, I wish it was okay to be gay. Now it was, no, there are scholars, straight scholars, that are saying there's another way to read this passage, and there's another way to read this verse, and here's how, and here's why I think this is the better way. Um, I was discovering words like malakos and arsenicos. I can never say it right. You know what we're talking about. Can I say it? Yeah, that one. Um, and... And they didn't mean what I was always taught that they, they meant. I was seeing that there was a whole better way to read these verses. And before I knew it, it I don't remember when it happened. It just happened. I woke up one day, and I was not scared of being gay. No longer did I think I was going to burn in hell for being gay. And I was able to take it to God. And talk to God without straight face on. I can't pinpoint the moment, but I do know that it was just a process, and, and I just woke up one day and realized it happened. Nobody still knew, not even Connie, nobody still knew at this point that I was gay, but I had become okay with it. And that was a big moment for me. All throughout the New Testament, we get this, um, this parallel to our spirituality with darkness and light. Jesus talked about darkness and light. Paul talked about darkness and light. John talked about darkness and light. They all kind of vary what they mean by that. But for me, I was able to take these things of, my, of myself out of the darkness into the light. And that was the most beautiful moment ever. Because I was able to shed some... When you shed light on it, you're able to experience the love that God has for that area of your life too. You know, I think that's the beauty, I think that's the whole beauty of the analogy of the light and the darkness is that God's love is so huge that no matter what part of you you shine light on, he's still going to love you. And I had that realization. And I'm going to teach you a song and I'm going to make you stand up because we're an hour and a half into this, so you need to stand. Um this was always my favorite worship song. And it's a youth retreat song, but you're going to learn it anyway. So, it goes something like this. Into marvelous light, I'm running. you got to run like this. Out of darkness, out of shame, by the cross, you are the truth. You are the life, you are the way. Did you get that? So in the, marvelous, in the marvelous light, I'm running. Out of darkness, out of shame, by the cross, you are the truth, you are the life, you are the way. All right. In the marvelous light,
big moment with God, I was like, okay, I'm gay. I know you always knew that, but here I am. We're going to acknowledge it. We're going to talk about it. Um, and my excitement of that rolled into just one big emotional meltdown. <laughs> Like I said earlier, when you bring things to the light, it makes you experience the fullness of God's love in a way you never had before. And it can be a bit overwhelming. When you've spent your entire life feeling like if you acknowledge this part of you, then God will surely hate you, and then you do it, and all you get is unconditional love and acceptance from God, that'll knock you on the ground. It's just like, I mean, if you spent your whole life thinking that your dad would surely hate you if you told him you were gay. And then you do it. And he says, you're my son. I love you no matter what. I love for you. And it did me. 
But it changed my relationship with God forever. It changed my life. I mean, it's the reason I preach nothing but freedom and love and authenticity today. Because I got to experience that, that fullness of love that Christ has for us. Oh,
mess with my head because, you know, by this point I was okay with being gay, but I was doing this, I called it the greater good game. I, I didn't, still didn't want to come out. I still planned on living a life celibate in the closet in the ministry because I thought I could be a greater good there in the Baptist world. I was like, you know what, I'm teaching my kids about grace now. Like, the youth group has just blown up because I started talking about grace and love. And teenagers are just like adults. They're hungry for that too. You know, to feel that love and that grace from God. And the more I preached it, the, the more, you know, they just kept growing. And I was like, I can't, can't leave them behind by, just by coming out. But then this kid killed himself and just totally messed everything up. And I saw myself in that kid. You know, as the picture was up on the screen, it was just like, it could have been me. That would have been me. I hadn't fallen asleep. You know? God told me about as clear as I've ever heard him. I want you to come out. I was weeping over this kid in the shower. Or I was in the shower. But I was just weeping over it. I want you to come out. I was like, no, no. It's stupid. God, I got a great thing going here. We've got a we've got a great thing going here. Like why would you have me set all this up and then <laughs> take it away by coming out? Straight face is doing great. <laughs> like, this is awesome. He said, Brandon, if you don't speak out about stuff like this, you're just as much part of the problem. And this kid's blood is on your hands as much as anyone else. Because your silence is deadly. I'd like to say I was very spiritual. I was like, yes, Lord. I get it now. But I audibly responded, hell no. No, I'm not coming out. I have too much to lose. I'll, I'll have no friends. Man, what are my family going to say? Um, I'm going to lose my job. Like uh, this is, I, I, I need this job to eat. <laughs> I'm not coming out. So we fought it out. And it got ugly. Real ugly. Um, it's going to sound weird. And... I don't say this often, but I'm around more Pentecostal-minded folks, so I can say it around you. Uh, I kept saying no to God so much over the next two months that finally on my way to seminary, I was driving to seminary, which makes it even more ironic, God's telling me again, I want you to come out. I'm like, no, God, no. Like, no. Stop it with this already. Like, no. I've already settled this. <laughs> and he said, you know what? I've told you what I want you to do. I'm moving forward. You can catch up when you're ready. And I've never had a feeling quite like, I felt like the presence of his spirit just went. I couldn't pray anymore. Couldn't hear God anymore, you know. And I, I'm just, I didn't actually hear audible voice. It's just, you know, feeling the presence of God. Um, couldn't preach. Couldn't do anything. Like nothing. I couldn't do a thing. And that's not a fun place to be. Especially when you're getting paid to preach. <laughs> um, I just moved on. He said, I told you what I need you to do. 
we can't go anywhere until you catch up with this. And that's just it. So I held out for months. And finally, November, I couldn't do it anymore. Um, I went to the Outlaw Preacher Conference in September. Snuck away. Told the church I was going to record a Christian album. <laughs> I went to the conference instead. <laughs> and... uh as I left the conference, I was like, "This is it. I, I got to do this." Like that's where I, that's where I met Jay was at that conference, um, and Pete Rollins and these guys, and uh, Tim Cure. That's where I met Tim. I met Tim. I walked into the conference, and here comes this huge dude because he was a lot bigger back then. Comes this huge dude with these big earrings in, and he's smoking a clove, and he's like, "Hey, pretty boy." I need a ride to town. Get in the car. I'm like, yes, just don't eat me. Like, <laughs> I'll take you anywhere. <laughs> That's how I met Tim. Um, <laughs> okay, so I went with my buddy to the conference who was about the same size as Tim. There were two of them, so I went with two other guys. They're both the same size as Tim, so it's just me and these three huge guys. <laughs> and it was so funny because we get pile in. I just met Tim. We pile in this car, and I'm in a Chevy Cobalt. My tire pressure light went on because they were putting so much pressure in my car. I couldn't go over a speed bump. <laughs> I was just like, okay, like I'm getting like three miles to the gallon now. Thanks, guys. Um, so I, I left the conference knowing like, okay, I can't say no anymore. Like, this is beautiful. Why am I not doing this? Um, and that's when I had... Uh, had the moment where I read from you guys this morning. Where I finally was just like, okay, God, I'm in. I don't understand it. I can't, I, po I can't possibly conceive what good is going to come from me coming out. Like, I don't get it. You're just ruining my life. Thanks. Um, but I did it. Well, I didn't do it right then, but I, I told him yes anyway. That was a weird moment. It was both cathartic, scary, exciting, and really, really sad. Um, but I was glad to be back on track with what God wanted. Uh, I think the song. Well, let's do this.
I listen to some song that reminds us a lot. And it was one of the last two verses. So I did it. <laughs> um, it's a process. Started with my brother. My brother was gay. Uh, he came out about eight years before I did. I guess I should include that in the story. That was kind of a big deal. Sorry. Skip over the part. Um, called him up. Told him. Actually, I'm sorry. Connie was the first person I told. Um, I finally get, got up the courage to actually talk to other gay guys. Um, so I downloaded one of the dating apps, and uh, I would only talk to people that were like 50 miles away or more. Like I wouldn't do it anywhere close. I couldn't risk that. Um, so we can do that in Arkansas because there's only a gate like every 10 miles. Um, <laughs> and so I'd met a guy. Um, I won't go into all that. But anyway, I was excited about it that I had actually started talking to somebody, you know. Um, I wasn't out, so it wasn't like I was planning on dating. So Connie's on Facebook. It's like 11 o'clock at night. I'll pop in. Hey, what's up, sweetie? Oh, you know, just hanging out. Um, kind of met someone. Oh, really? Yeah, they, they are really cool. Um, they live about an hour from here. They, uh, they got a really nice smile. They, they make me feel really good. And she was like, well, that's good. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, um, maybe you can meet them sometime. <laughs> Finally, she just said it. What's his name? <laughs> and it was actually I said what? Like I was supposed to tell you. You weren't supposed to tell me. <laughs> Shelly didn't have a clue before then either. She was just, yeah, it was the pronouns. That's what got her. She was like, wait a second. Um, and uh, anyways, I told her and uh, I told my brother, called my mom. 
Um, I'm going to make you get the book to get my mom's response because I can't say it in the pulpit. Um, <laughs> she, she was a, my mom, my mom used to be a sailor apparently. Um, and so, but anyway, she was told, I, I told her over the phone because I knew she was going to be fine because she'd throw me hands for a while. Um, she kind of always knew. She told me she always knew ever since I was like that big. Uh, moms know. They just do. Um, so, but there was my dad left. And I wasn't going to tell anyone else until I told my dad. Well, actually, I lied. Uh, I just made that up. Um, my original plan was um, I was going to. I was gonna get in a relationship first. <laughs> I was like, okay, for dad, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ease this one out. So, he and my mom went through a divorce during the same time. This was all going on. Um, they split probably about six months before I came out, and uh, so he was having kind of a rough time, and uh, he didn't want to spend New Year's alone. So he said, hey, you bring all your friends over. By this point, I had also kind of dropped the Baptist doctrine on alcohol. Because um, I dropped the Baptist doctrine on a lot of other things too, um, and so he was like, "Hey, bring your friends over for New Year's, and I'll be the bartender. It's all free." He's like, "I just don't want to be here by myself." I'm like, okay, <laughs> works for us. We're 23 years old. We'll take all the free alcohol we can get. Um, and <laughs> or 22 at the time, 23. Anyway, um, so we go. I'm I'm really good at counting my drinks because I don't like to get too gone, so like I, I I make a habit of just counting and knowing where I am, you know, so I don't get wasted. Um, quite a few shots into it, though, he let me know that oh, I wasn't using liqueur, I was using PGA, 100% pure grain alcohol, ethanol. Well, here we go, <laughs> and it kicked in. Yeah, only time I've ever blacked out in my life. Blacked out at 10.30. I came to at midnight, coming out to my dad. <laughs> Sitting at the kitchen table. <laughs> you know what he said, though? The same thing I always dreamed God would say when I told him that. His exact words were, you know what? You're my son. Nothing's ever going to change that. I love you just the way you are. I'm going to bed. <laughs> That's how that transpired. Um, so it sounds odd that God would use my drunken night, but he did, because I would have never come out to my dad any other way. Like, before a long time after that, I just wouldn't have the courage. Um, so I reached down and grabbed my phone, text my brother, just came out to dad, it went well. Sin. It's Kirsten, my best friend. She's at the house. She's right there. <laughs> I'm looking at her from the kitchen table. What the hell? I sent it to her instead of my brother. I go, I might as well get this over with. Come here. <laughs> so she comes to the kitchen table. Rewind about a month. I told you I was on the gay dating app. Didn't have a picture up or anything, of course. But I had my info. 180 pounds, 5 foot 11. My, my best friend's roommate was in the band at college. And I don't know if you know this, but bands in colleges have a lot of gay people, and so she had a friend over. That friend goes, there's someone 38 feet away. So I'm sitting on my side of the duplex, because she was on that side of the duplex. I'm, she and I are sitting here watching TV. Her roommate comes in. Luckily for me, her roommate is not a very good whisperer. She goes, someone's on the app and they're 38 feet away. It's someone in this duplex. In the duplex was just our friends. That was it. We all kind of like lived together. Flip out. My heart drops. I'm in my phone. Delete, delete, delete. They leave. About five minutes later, I get a text from Kurt. Hey, um, how tall are you? I knew exactly what it was. I immediately respond, I am five foot ten. Why? Oh, no reasons. We were just having a little roomy trivia game. Whatever. So, back to New Year's Eve. Tell Kurt to come over. She comes over. She goes, what's up? It's Kurt. I'm 5'11". 
What? Kurt, 5'11". Oh! <laughs> it all made sense. <laughs> so once I came out to her, I, I came out to the rest of my friend group. We had we'd formed a really cool close bond. Um, we, were all, we were all in the church together. We are all 20-somethings. But we had started a little Bible study on Sunday nights together, and we were kind of secretly reading, like, Brian McLaren and stuff. So we kind of all grew on this together. So I knew I was safe to come out to them, and I did. And they were all beautiful about it. And uh, I talked to Connie, and she was just like, well, we got to get you out of the church before you come out, or it's going to be really bad. And I was like, okay. So my plan was I was going to quietly flee to Memphis and just disappear. Then I could come out. So I resigned in January, and that was the 22nd was the last day, January 22nd of 2012. I left the church, left the Baptist church, went to Memphis. January 24th, which happens to be today, 2012, I was outed to the entire community of my old church. So I officially came out on this day. This is my three-year anniversary. Huh. Um. <laughs> or as Steve-O calls it, um, birthday. It's my birthday. <laughs> um, it was ugly. Much uglier than I anticipated. Um, I got some death threats. Got some threats that better never see me in the street ever again. Someone wanted to spoon my eyeballs out. That was someone from the staff. Um, one of the pastors wanted me to go to Memphis and hope I'd disappear, never to be seen again. Um, the messages were just crazy, though. I mean, they just swarmed in. It happened at night. I had no idea what was going on. Like, it, it was a Tuesday night. I, I was asleep. I wake up Wednesday morning to a phone full of just... Germans are attacking. Um, <laughs> um, and so I wake up to this phone just full of just hate messages. And it's just out of the blue. And it, it made it harder, I think, because I didn't know it was going to happen. Like it was, at least if I were to come out, I could anticipate it. This was just the people that literally two days before had heralded me their golden child and never wanted me to leave the church to suddenly, I wish you were never born. Um, you've, ruined our, you've ruined our lives. Um, you've sent our kids to hell. There's everything. Um, but you know what? It was totally worth it. As bad as that time was, and it was bad, it was totally worth it because, I, you know, as I said earlier, I told God, like, why are we doing this? Exactly. And I really reminded God of that, too, during this time period. I was like, remember when I said this was not going to be a good idea? Like, you remember I said that? Yeah, well, it's turning out not to be such a good idea. Um, <laughs> but what God wants, God gets. God helps all. And thank God, because he really does know best. And uh, I would have never anticipated one, well, I never anticipated I'd be in Sydney talking about coming out. <laughs> um, some cool things have happened since I came out, though, um, because what I learned through the whole experience was the beauty of authenticity and how how much God wants us to be authentic. And I think it's going to be. I think God is going to use the gay community to teach the church that. Um, I've made good friends with uh, Brian, which is funny. The the guy who I was told I'm not allowed to read. Uh, I've made friends with his wife, Grace, and she's a big supporter. And uh, you know, they have a gay son that's a couple years older than myself. And Grace says all the time, like, "What if? And what if? What if it's God's big cosmic joke that the next generation of Christians is led by the gay people?" And I think we're going to see that in a way because we know how evil inauthent inauthenticity can be. And we know how much wearing a mask can destroy your life. And so we do have a story to tell. Something that other people, other Christians can learn from us to realize the power of authenticity 
and how that authenticity leads you to transparency with other people, and that transparency leads you to true community. And when we reach that true community, it's one of the most beautiful things in the world.